Good to go. Okay, well, here we are. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we bow before you. We worship you. We thank you that you are God, the living God. Lord, we thank you that you are, you are the one who is, and who will forever be. And Lord, we thank you that by your grace, you have made yourself known to us. Father, as we see in a world that is more and more uh, falling into degeneracy, the effects of sin, the power of sin, Lord, <clears throat> we thank you for, as your word says, the firmness, the truth of who you are, that you are a rock that is immovable, that the whole universe is based on the reality of who you are. And we thank you today as we look in your word and uh, see the subject of covenant. We pray that it will be a deeper, fuller revelation to us of the certainty of who you are, of your relationship with us, truly as well, our destiny because of your grace for us in Jesus Christ. So we bind Satan, in the name of Jesus, we pray to hinder or harm us, and just ask you, Holy Spirit, to open our hearts and move among us. For we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All righty. Okay. Uh, so we're looking briefly, of course, it's only a focus. Uh, the overview is chapter 12, Genesis, or basically after 25. But the focus is upon Abram or Abraham. You'll see now we have Abram, Abraham. In his life, he's given the name first, Abram. And then in chapter 17 of Genesis, God changes his name to Abraham. Most often, we are used to him. They called Abraham. And uh, it, it's important to see the perspective that the account is first and foremost about the purpose of God. You know, we look at and often read the Bible and see it on the horizontal plane, see the events, but ultimately the Bible is about God and about what God is doing in history and people's lives for his war and honor. Now it's about God's faithfulness and his purpose. Also, the faith and trust of Abraham in God. And uh, what's important in this is the growing obedience that Abraham had. When there is true faith, there is growing obedience to it, not perfection, because we can't be perfect for this one. Now, the culmination uh, of this relationship is that the Lord forever identifies himself as, and his name. You see, name and person go together. The name is a revelation of what a person is in the Bible, but also it identifies uh, who, uh, who he is. So God reveals himself as the God of Abraham. And so these, the, his, his title, his name, the God of Abraham. And by the way, where God expressly says this is the next six. When he's speaking to Moses, he said, uh, this is my name, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But uh, it reveals, first of all, Abram, Abraham's actual personal relationship with God. Uh, what is important about this is while individuals may be members of a corporate covenant community of the people of God. Okay, so when people receive the outward sign of the covenant, they become then members of the covenant. Okay, they must nevertheless personally come to true faith and trust. And I say that faith and trust because the one word in Greek or also in Hebrew, we use different words, faith, trust, belief. And so, you know, it, it can be faith is, is a, you know, more of an active thing, trust is more of a passive, and then, you know, believe is what you do, but that's a basic concept. That a person has to have a personal relationship with God. We see this in, for example, the life of the church. Okay? A person often in our church, and not like Abraham, but many are uh, like 
Isaac, and Jacob, they received the sign of the covenant as a child or as a baby, right? And so you go through all that, you talk about them being adopted, signed, sealing, but still in the vows, what are stated is that this child must come to personal faith and confession of Christ. So just having an outward sacrament doesn't make you a true believer. And of course, this is what we see all through the history of Israel, where they're the people of God, the covenant of God, they have signs of covenant. There's so many that are living lives that are in utter rebellion. But Abraham is the prime example of a person who is living by faith uh, in God. He is a person who is, and we, important in this sense, saved. By grace through faith. Okay, I don't have time to go into it, but there is a distinction in the sense of being justified, <laughs> which is being declared righteous and being saved. Okay, it just uh, grabs, you know, when we click the Romans, but basically, we often say you're not saved by works. Okay, well, nobody's saved by works. Okay. Because if you have works, you don't need to be saved. See, does that make sense? If I work, I earn it, and so I don't need to be saved. The problem is the people who need to be saved are the people who fail. So we are saved by grace. But the one person who was not saved by works, who would that be? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. Okay. The one person who is justified by works. Every is believer. Jesus. Yeah. Okay. See, nobody's saved by their works unless it's, you would say, because of the work, not on the basis of their own works. All right. So uh, the account of Abraham shows his growing obedience based on and rooted in true faith. And we see his failures. Which I, of course, the Bible is real. All the heroes except for Jesus had deep flaws, one way or another. Can anybody identify? <laughs> so you see him leaving the land, uh, you know, lying in a sense, but not technically, you know, fully deceiving about uh, his wife Sarah, or I mean, the sister, uh, trying to fulfill the promise of their power. But ultimately, it culminated in him offering his son Isaac as a burnt offering. So the actual true faith trust of Abraham is manifested, and again, in growing obedience. Now, the reason I emphasize that is because, uh, you know, in a culture that is, has been inherited from a Protestant understanding, and a true biblical understanding that we're saved by grace, not works, <coughs> often people will separate absolutely faith and works and so that basically it becomes antinomian i'm saved by grace i don't have to work if you don't have works you don't really have faith you're not saved because of your works you're saved because of and through faith christ <laughs> but it's like this the works are the fruit if you don't have fruit your root is dead I was just going to say that Reverend Warnock in Georgia said that you don't have to be a Christian to be saved. You just have to do good works for people. Oh, okay. So he got all my stuff. I know what you're talking about. He's the guy that said Jesus really didn't write some stuff. Okay. Uh, so God being God of Abraham, now we get into the covenant.
same, same, same. Scripture verses there now, turning it over. Well, there are different definitions of what a covenant is. Fundamentally, a covenant is a formalized, binding, legal promise of commitment. Okay, how many of you ever been married? Then we're back to poor old Karen. She can't hear it either. Just like you. Okay, getting the, the you know the truly beloved loved of uh, Wesley. Okay, anyway, so they're set up. So Humperdinck wants to marry her, and so he gets the. I can't remember what he's called, the awesome uh, minister clergy. And here's this guy who has you know, a clergy garb, and they show the scene, and he goes, Middle Age, that was an arrangement. You know, it's a stupid guy. Anyway. And so Hubbard did just says, say, man and wife, say man and wife. Man and wife. And so they go away, and she's all depressed because they're married. Well, Wesley comes along and says, you're not married. He goes, oh, you said that once. No. Did you say, I do? Did you make a promise? She said, no. Then you're not married. You cannot be married unless you say, I do. Now, the, the priest pronounces it, but all he pronounces is a declaration of what has already taken place. He doesn't make them married. They become married at the moment of I do, I do, because it is a bond of commitment, and it's a legal bond of commitment. Now, so the essence of a covenant is a word of promise or an oath. Now, this is important again to think. Uh, Jesus tells us, let your yes be yes and your no no, which means speak the truth. And so God could have just said, this is what I'm going to do. But as theologians, I don't say this, but God condescends in a sense, humbles himself to make a legal agreement, a covenant. And because of that, a covenant is uh, okay. has greater legal authority, responsibility, and accountability to the one who performs it. So the promise defines and delineates the intention and commitment to perform what is stated. Uh, and I want to say this kindly. But, you know, I think most of the vows still, at least they used to be in the wedding, are for better or worse. People like the better part, they don't like the worse. 
Two, the promise is based upon the promise maker's personal character, truthfulness, integrity, and ability to perform. And this is very important to understand covenant and the obligation. Okay, so you make a promise, but the fulfillment of that promise is based upon your own personal honesty, integrity, intention, what your character is, but also your ability. All right, now what happened with the people of Israel when they made the covenant with Moses? Everything God says, we will do. What did they do? Bill, 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 bill. So whatever their intentions were, they did not have the ability to fulfill it. And this is the purpose of the law. But the law tells us our obligations before God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind. Now this is, again, in the liturgy. Okay? It's said there, not like a, oh yeah, that's nice. This is the law of God that is to govern our relationships. All right, then we are to love God and we are to love one another. <laughs> now, it's interesting. I don't know if you, some of you know this, the liturgy has been changed. The old uh, liturgy, maybe not. But this is what's in it now, at least what is last. Year. After the law of God stated, it stated, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Why? Because the law tells you. The requirement of God, what you are legally obliged to do before God is being a member of the covenant, your loyalty to Him. The law of God is on your heart. It tells you what to do. But if you're truly, truly aware of it, of your failures, then it leads you to Christ. And that's the purpose of the law Christ and mercy. So that it is in, after that, then forgiveness of sins. You know, confession is declared. So that's the purpose of the Old Testament Mosaic law. B, the covenant becomes the legal structural framework for governing the relationship of the parties. And this is vitally important. So, when fundamentally, when God says to Abraham, uh, Abraham comes to Abraham, walk before me. That's the essence of what it means to walk in a relationship before God in the presence of God, for the face of God, doing the will of God. So all the other laws and how they're delineated and unfold fundamentally are based upon the governing structure of legal requirement of covenant. Okay, now, uh, this is where we live in a world and, and a culture that's fundamentally lawless. So we just don't even think about it. But this is what's important to understand. A person who is born again of the Holy Spirit has the Holy Spirit living in your heart. And so the covenant, the new covenant, is that the law of God is written on your heart. It's no longer an outward law, which you don't have ultimately power to fulfill. It's written on your heart. So that you have now the holy desire and ability by the grace of God to do it. The other thing is this. The rule of God is not simply administered through an outside authority, a human being, or even a law written on stones. The rule of God is now manifested in your heart, in your absolute everyday nanosecond moment, how you live your life in relationship to God. And so that's the new covenant. It's that I am Christ. I have died to my old life. I've been risen with Christ. Christ lives in me. The life I live, I live my faith. The Son of God, who loved me. He is Lord. Okay. <clears throat> See, most often a covenant promise is formalized and sanctified by a ritual act of some kind. All right. So when you get married, you have a very festive marriage, or you can be just, I take you, I take you, whatever. But in the fair, greater covenants, it's formalized and visually portrayed. Now, the next thing is very important. See, faith, trust, belief 
This is bonding, and I use this quotes, power, energy, glue, and heat that connects, maintains the parties together in covenant relationship. If you have faith, then you come into relationship with God. You come into relationship because trust and faith are the essence of a whole healthy relationship. Now, when you look at all of history and you look at where we are today in a culture that is not only doubting, but just absolutely unbelieving in the word of God, where does it all begin? Well, it begins in the garden, did God say. And when you have doubt, doubt now is the entrance of unbelief. When you doubt, you don't trust, all right? When you doubt, you don't trust. It's not like you're being intellectually uh, honest or something. You know, your husband says something, I'm gonna do this. And, uh, I don't know. Huh? You won't. But right there, now what happens? Fear comes in. Uh-oh, your relationship with your husband or your spouse or some other, this now has turbulence on the wavelength. It's not solid. It's not secure. It's not unbreakable. Doubt now begins to loosen the bond, the adhesive. And ultimately, that doubt inevitably often leads to unbelief, unless you have the Holy Spirit. All right, so the power, the energy, the glue, a relationship with God and anybody is trust, it's faith. All right, it's because people are liars that we can't trust them. You never looked at your own life. Say you're going to do something that you don't budge on that one. You know, the Bible says all people are liars. Uh, I remember watching this 1930s movie, and uh, it was talking about breach of promise and how uh, somebody was going to somehow bring to court a breach of promise. And the statement was this, oh, that no longer has legal validity in the courts. A breach of promise. Now, that was way back then where you could make a promise and now you could violate the promise. It used to be a legal crime, punishable. But then it became, eh, you know, everybody does that. We all do that. Why do we need to prosecute? So then you get more and more lawyers. You get more and more legal. You get more and more, dis, you know, you ever get all that stuff which you never read to say, I read, you know, I hear whatever. All this stuff because people are liars. You don't trust people. And they're going to deceive, cheat, whatever. Now, God in his grace is not a liar. But he said, I'm making a covenant with you. So that you will know on the basis of your world the truth of what I'm saying and what I will do. Now, for this reason, that true faith and trust in God's truthfulness and ability to keep and fulfill his word of promise is the reason for God declaring a person to be righteous before him. Now, think about it. you know, there's a lot of things that can commend us in our relationship with people. What God says, the greatest, the most important thing that you can do in your relationship to me is just simply this. I believe you. I trust you. That happens. That determines your whole reality. Everything in your reality is determined by what you believe and by what you then believe about God. If you believe the truth about God, that determines your mind, your worldview, your reality, and you live out of that reality. That's the world we live in. Everybody lives out of the world they really believe in. They live out of the world they believe in. 
And the problem with us is that our minds are no longer are not to the extent conformed to the truth of the word of God. That's why the Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that our hearts are changed, not just to know, but to truly believe what God says. And it's simple. Did God say? Yes. That's it. I like what Sproul used to say, to remember him, simply to say, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. He said, that's not true. God said it. That settles it. Whether you believe it or not, it's irrelevant. This is true. And so relationship with God is based upon faith, believing him. So that the true descendants of Abraham, look to page three, are those who have the faith of Abraham. All right? And so because of this, the converse, the true faith to us is not existence, but the covenant is broken. Now, the covenant, in essence, is broken because of unbelief, can then be acted out. Now, where, where did the human race fall in the sin? Where did it actually fall? It fell when Adam has had stopped believing the word of God in his heart. That unbelief then was manifested in an outward act of violating the command. He didn't fall ultimately when he ate it, and then he fell. He fell because of unbelief. So people act out of what they believe, and I say this, well, what you fear. What you fear. Okay, this is the essence of the book of Proverbs. The beginning of wisdom is what? The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. Why? Because God's real. Because <clears throat> there's a real world. It's simply this. You will reap what you sow. Period. And maybe God will intervene, but there's always consequences. That is the reality. Okay. D, a covenant is made between two or more parties, as you can see here. Uh, <clears throat> and then I just make this note. The book of Genesis also shows that there were others who were not physical descendants of Abraham, who were nevertheless true believers. Now, Kizit, profound, who became one of the most important people in history, okay, because the promise of Psalm 110. You are priests forever after the order of his judgments. Okay, D. Covenant includes not only promises of blessing, yay, for the positive. We want to listen to this radio station because it's only positive. What are your doctor? Because he'll only tell you a nice thing. Even though you feel sick. When performed, the curse has been broken. So this is what we need to understand. This is verbally expressed in the making of a covenant. It's literally being cutting a covenant. Okay, when you read in English Bibles and say make a covenant, but the word is cut because fundamentally in a covenant, not all covenants, but fundamentally in a covenant, you sacrifice an animal. It was cut, was shed, blood was shed. All right, now, see, if you think about that too, this is where you go back to Genesis. Okay, a promise was made in Genesis 15. Uh, 350. Where was the covenant cut? Yeah. Circumcision. Uh, animals were killed for clothing. Yeah. When the animal's blood was shed, and then that animal skin covered Adam and Eve. See, when we look back at that event, it's not just, oh, okay, there's an absolute critical understanding. God is now making a covenant promise. <laughs> Now, two, this is ver visually portrayed in the slaying and shedding of the blood. Okay, so you can read that. The cutting of the animals. Now, I want to read this again. Uh, God tells Abram to get all these animals, you know, a, a number of animals. Verse 10, it says, he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds and so when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. 
On that day, the Lord made or cut a covenant with Abraham. What in the world is going on? How many of you uh, listen to R.C. Sproul? <laughs> Sproul said he, you know, was in prison and he only had one book of the Bible and he chose the book of Hebrews. If he only had one verse of the Bible, he would choose that verse. When the sun had gone down, the smoking pot, the flaming torch passed between them. What does that mean? Okay, very important. The cutting of the animals and the passing of the smoking fire pod flaming torch passed between these pieces is visual portrayal of the curse of the covenant. In making the covenant, God is saying that if he fails to keep the covenant, he will literally die. That's what that means. <laughs> this means that the very existence of God the very existence of the universe created and sustained by God would no longer <laughs> exist. Now, <clears throat> three things make it impossible for God not to keep and fulfill his covenant promise. Okay? And this is important. When I think of things that we're looking at and we're saying faith, covenant, commitment, these are, as much as anything, absolutely the most important for our relationship with God. It is impossible for God to lie. And people might call them a liar. Accuse them of lying. They're a liar. Concerning the character. Again, a promise depends upon the character of the individual man. Is a person honest, truthful? God is truthful. It is impossible for him to lie. The second thing is his ability. Now, this again, you know, in the Old Testament, if under Moses, they make a commitment, but you don't have the ability to fulfill it. Does God have the ability to fulfill what he promises? Yes. This is why when he appears to Abraham, he says, I am God Almighty. I am the God who can do anything. Nothing is impossible. And I promise to you that you will have an heir, this land, and now I am bringing this about through you, who is now basically as good as dead, and through your wife, who is totally barren. Absolutely impossible, humanly. I will bring it because nothing is impossible for me. Now, the third reason is what's called reality. In the technical word in philosophy, it's called ontology. It comes from the word meaning being, what is. It can be very abstract. But the question is, what is what is reality? Not what it's fantasy. It's turned the TV on and people living for fantasy world. That's a problem. What is? What is? Is God. You guys remember uh, the rest of the sermon I sang? I <laughs> preached in the beginning of Genesis. As I said, the most important words are not God created the world, but in the beginning, God. 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 If you ever read Francis Schaeffer, you know, he talks about history and everything. He said, the gospel doesn't begin with Jesus died for your sins, it begins with God. The God who is there, period. God exists. And it is often difficult because we can fantasize that it is impossible for God not to exist, period. The only other option is that there is nothing, period. The only other option. God is, and because of that, everything else came into being. So these things, three things make it absolutely impossible for God not to fulfill his covenant. Now, I'm going to apply it's not in this, but in this here. One day, you're going to die, probably. <laughs> is all things the same? What do you believe? Are you afraid? Or do you trust God? Do you know reality? God who said, whoever believes in me will never 
God. Is that true or not? Jesus died for my sins in space and time and history. My sins are forgiven. I have been saved by grace through faith, and my destiny is in Christ. I believe that absolutely nothing can separate me from the love of God because God has said it, and it is impossible for Him to lie. That's the reality. And so no matter how bumpy the road is in this world, that's reality. All right. <clears throat> now, visually, the signs, uh, the covenant is portrayed in signs. All right. In signs of the covenant. So in the Old Testament under Abraham, again, it was circumcision. We come into the New Testament, the, the continuation of the concept of circumcision is baptism. Now, people don't often see this, okay? But basically, circumcision is the organ of generation, okay? And so it's a cutting away. It's a cutting off. Cutting off of the old, and it's the new. So it's a sign of covenant of setting apart from the old, from the world, being made born of God by the power of God during the covenant. When you come to baptism, now, outward form is done differently visually. You have different outward forms. But in our church, primarily, it's not the only way, primarily it's done by sprinkling. Why? Because sprinkling outwardly demonstrates two things. The sprinkling of the blood of Jesus that washes away our sins. Like on the day of atonement. Rebirth of the Holy Spirit. So you hear that in the baptismal liturgies. Or, as Baptists will exclusively say the only way, is that you have to be immersed or dunked. And that is, you know, there's biblical grounds for that imagery, but not the exclusive theology. That you die and you rise again. But whether it's sprinkling, whether it's like uh, the Eastern Orthodox, where you take a baby and immerse them upside down three times, <laughs> whatever the other form. It's all the same. It means that you die to your old way of life in Adam. The blood of Jesus washes you, and you have been raised to a new life. That is a covenant promise. And this is a covenant promise that if you come to true faith in God and the Lord Jesus Christ, the same way Abraham did, then the promise to Abraham is yours. You are a child of Abraham spiritually, physically. All the promises given to him are yours because they have been given to him now in Christ. And everything in Christ is now yours. All right? Okay. This Abrahamic covenant is renewed and established. Well, let me just say this. What comes to my mind is this. How many of you were away? It's what that ring means in the covenantal obligations and vows. So the essence of that meaning of that ring is not the gold, which could be any shape or form. You can have a huge one, you know, a cigarette paint, <laughs> an unsinkable Molly Brown, if you remember that. All right? But it's what the thing means. Our form will symbolize something, but the essence of it is covenant. And so that covenant is the essence. Now, <clears throat> this Abrahamic covenant is renewed and established through the line of individuals God sovereignly chose. So through history, he is called in, and we'll look at this Lord in a couple of weeks, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Israel. Okay. Jacob is, this is his Abram, uh, Abram, Abraham, so it's Jacob, Israel. <clears throat> now, uh, <clears throat> one key aspect, moving on to page five. One key aspect of God's covenant with the patriarchs <laughs> is that he gave them new names. I don't know if you have a thought. Okay, here's Abram, 
But when God now unfolds the covenant, he gives him a new name. You're no longer exalted, Father, now you're Father of nations. God gives him that name. How was Isaac named? Israel. No, Isaac. Isaac. That was David. Okay, the same time, Genesis 17, uh, you know, God tells Abram that Sarah, his wife, is going to have a job. He goes, <laughs> What a joke. God goes, okay, great. We'll call him Isaac. What does Isaac mean? God, laughter. God laughed. I love it. I mean, can God make a joke? <laughs> I know it just shows you again. It's like God laughs. God is joy. He didn't have his name changed. That's who he was. Then you have Jacob. Jacob comes out of the womb. What's he doing? Holding on to his brother's heel. This is what he is in the flesh. And we'll look at this, Lord willing, in two weeks. But his name is changed by God to become Israel. All right, see, now, you were born with a name and an identity, an inheritance. But when you came to Christ, you had a new name, the name that God has given to you. And that's your true, ultimate identity. You are who God says you are. And so because you're Christ, you're his. There is a wonderful song by Hillsong. Now it goes like, that. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Why is that so significant nowadays? Because people are lost. <laughs> people don't know who they are. We were just joking over here before. Sunday school. People go out, I want to find myself. Who am I? Why are you lost? You're lost because you're looking in the wrong place. You don't know who you are. Or you have your identity based on something that's unstable. I'll give you an example. How many people become famous or celebrities? Got all the fame. And then they move out of the stage. All of a sudden their life crashes. Your whole identity is based upon that. And I say this kind of totally worthless fame of the people. It's just a hollow applause. Money, wealth, heritage, whatever it is. The ultimate truth of who we are is who God says we are. Everything else is passing away. That will never pass away. And when we know that, and believe it, you live in a world of reality. And though whatever happens to you, nothing can separate you from the reality of the love of God, the truth of God, that you're His forever and ever. That your destiny is with Him forever. And that's because of this. This is the last statement here. Because of the Abrahamic coming with the covenant was established through the painter of God's name is forever the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, the God of God, the God of Jesus, God of Jesus, whoever, the God of Bill, he's mine forever and ever because I am his. Let's pray to Father, we bless you, we praise you, we give you glory, we give you honor. And we just pray and I pray that you hope, by your grace, open our hearts to the reality of this truth. To see is to believe. To believe is to know. To know is to live. And so we pray for this reality in our lives. Fill us with your presence, your power, your goodness, your grace. God, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.